So, uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Ian Bickerstaff from Sony um, Computer Entertainment, based in, in England, um, only about 100 miles from where I'm based, in York in England. Um, Ian's going to talk today about a stereoscope for the PlayStation generation. Um, a lot of his presentation will be in 3D, which I think will work really well. Um, he gave a okay. talk to my students in York, very lucky to have that a few weeks ago, um, and if this is as good as that with 3D, it will be an excellent presentation. So, over to Ian. Well, thank you very much, uh, and I mean, good morning, everyone. And firstly, just to make sure everyone's got 3D glasses, because um, yeah, it is fantastic. It's going to be hopefully uh, in 3D. So, yeah, firstly, a, a massive uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to uh, present this keynote today. It's uh, it's quite a quite an honour, really. Um, it, it's a few years since uh, I last stood here, and. A great deal has uh, changed. We've seen the focus of attention go from stereoscopic 3D uh, onto virtual reality. And Sony Computer Entertainment has, in fact, last year launched its own project, Morpheus, uh, which should be the, the perfect partner for the uh, PlayStation platform, our new PlayStation 4. So as we speak, uh, developers uh, who were previously creating stereoscopic 3D games are now busy um, creating virtual reality experiences, and it's going to be fascinating to see what they come up with. Well, today my presentation is going to look at the technology be behind virtual reality. Um, before we do that, I thought it would be worth first looking at what uh, Project Morpheus is all about. So the idea is to try and create a system that completely convinces you you're in a virtual world. It's all about uh, creating a sense of presence. And the way we do that is with various components. So we have a small display situated right in front of your eyes based on mobile phone technology. And then optics, very wide field of view optics that throw the image uh, out into the distance as if you're looking through a window. We add to that accurate 360-degree head tracking, both in terms of position and orientation, so that no matter where you're looking, the image looks correct all around you, and that completely immerses you in the virtual world. We can also add binaural 3D audio as well. Um, through a pair of uh, headphones. Now, this doesn't just uh, work like normal stereo. It models the way sound enters the human ear. So it uh, doesn't just appear to come from the left and right, but from in front and behind you, and even uh, above and below you as well. We can interact with the virtual world using tracked peripherals. And on the PlayStation, we have uh, our move controller, which is optically tracked. And also, the main game controller for PlayStation 4 is itself uh, has li a light bar, as it's called, and that uh, can be optically tracked as well. And we don't want to isolate the player in the virtual reality experience. This is uh, often a criticism of virtual reality. So we can send the image from the device to a television so that other people can uh, enjoy the virtual reality experience and maybe interact with it uh, as well using perhaps their tablet or their mobile phone. So here's the thing. The concept actually is a lot older than you might imagine. And in fact, it dates all the way back to here with uh, Morton Heilig, who's proposed this uh, virtual reality device, head-mounted display. And let's have a look at the specification. He had wide field of view optics as well. He also mentions binaural 3D audio and uh, an internal air circulation system even that uh, simulates the breeze on your face. And all with a comfortable, balanced ergonomic design. So the question is, well, why have very few people heard of that? What, what went wrong? And really, the answer is that, of course, the technology wasn't available at the time to create such a device. 
In fact, it's only just available now, and when I say just, I mean within a matter of months. We've got a situation where the mobile phone industry has uh, had enormous advances in display technology and also movement detection as well. And the uh, console game industry has given us uh, amazing real-time image generation capability to feed those displays. And we've got other progress uh, in all sorts of industries, anything from audio processing to uh, computer-designed optics uh, as well. But having said that, I mean, although it's uh, fantastic to have computer-designed optics, actually the basic principles of the optics date back an awful long time. So before I said it gives the impression that you're looking through a window, well, what does that mean? Well, in a sense, it's all about asking a question of what's the difference between looking at an image on a screen and looking at the real thing through a window. And I suppose a lot of it is down to what happens when you change your viewpoint. So here I'm moving this camera around, and you can see that the two images are behaving in a completely different way. We've got uh, motion parallax there. There's only one position where the two images line up. And even in that position, they're focused at a completely different distance as well. So the question is, could we come up with a device that solves these two problems? Well, the answer is quite a simple one. All we need is a magnifying glass. We just place the magnifying glass in front of the display, and then the image on the display appears to have come, come from somewhere in the distance. Well, it's all very well showing a diagram, but I thought I'd show you what it actually looks like. So here I've placed a magnifying glass in front of the display, and now you can see that as I move the camera around, the image on the display pretty much perfectly lines up with the view out of the window. And it's focused at the same distance as well. In fact, it has to be for this particular illusion to work. Now, in order to achieve this, the alignment of the components is really critical. So the projection center of the image on the display has to exactly line up with the optical center of the lens, and the fields of view have to match as well. So for binocular vision, we effectively need two sets of lenses. And now we're getting very close to the sort of optical arrangement that we have in our head-mounted display. The images are arranged in a side-by-side -side configuration with a central septum dividing uh, the display in two so that the left eye only sees the left eye image and so on. Now, actually, this arrangement dates back all the way to Sir David Brewster's original lenticular stereoscope from uh, 1849. And at that time, it wasn't possible to make lenses with a consistent focal length. So he came up with the innovation of using a single large lens, dividing it in two, and then that gives you the two eyepieces. Swapping them around, you can see that the optical centers are now a bit further apart than our eyes are. And so this dictates the uh, size of the image on the display as well. Now, the lens block actually opens up for cleaning. And you can look inside, and you can see the sort of half lenses just as they are in that diagram. And they, they look like prisms, don't they? So it sort of it is deflecting the light inwards towards your eyes. The images themselves were supplied on interchangeable uh, stereo cards. And I thought I'd show you a, a selection of just a, a few images that were created around that time. Or in fact, uh, in this case, we know the exact time. It was the 12th of August, 1858. And the images look impressive now. And it's almost impossible to imagine how astonishing these images must have appeared at that time. So in 
So the device allowed you to illuminate the cards from the front using a mirror arrangement, and that gave a very directional light, which was necessary for the early silvery surface of daguerreotype images. But also you could view glass slides as well using the uh, ground glass screen to give you back illumination. Now, I may be wrong about this, but I suspect that the original stereoscope uh, was probably one of the very first modern consumer products. You had the concept that you bought a device and then you bought content for it, the hardware software uh, idea. And certainly these stereoscopes were manufactured in enormous numbers and so, of course, were the stereo cards. Now, inevitably, you get a, a situation from time to time where there would be manufacturing defects. So, for example, the stereo cards could be um, vertically misaligned, for example. And this next stereoscope has a very innovative way, quite a simple way, of solving that problem. It was made by the optical instrument uh, manufacturer Smith Beck and Beck around about 1860. And they also made Charles Darwin's microscope. So we're talking the, uh, the ultimate in quality. It's full of innovations, but let's see how it goes about solving um, misaligned stereo cards. So here we have our misaligned stereo card. We've got vertical misalignment. And what he did was he rotated the eyepieces, which had the effect of rotating the prismatic lenses so that instead of just having a sort of horizontal shift towards your eyes, you got a little bit of a vertical shift as well to correct for the parallax errors. So let's have a go at doing that. Uh, if I can advance the slide. Try again. There we go. And so we rotate the lenses and correct for the misalignment. Now, of course, you have to remember to put the lenses back again when you're viewing the next stereo card. So this stereoscope from about 50 years later takes things even further, and we've now got full calibration of the adjustment. But here's a funny thing. I mean, it's a brilliant stereoscope and amazing optical quality, but it's actually quite difficult to get an image on it. If you put your stereo, stereo card uh, in the device, it takes ages to set up all the adjustments to get uh, a good image. Compare that to, if the clicker will advance, there we go, uh, to the simplicity of the Holmes Bates stereoscope. This is regarded in, by many as the classic stereoscope. And all American design, made uh, in massive numbers, it's very simple to make, and also simple to use as well. You could just view cards in the device, not much adjustment, just focus, uh, and it worked very well. And take things a step further still, and we've got Viewmaster, where there is no adjustment whatsoever on the device, and yet it works for both adults and children alike. And in fact, this is the kind of thing that uh, very much we try to do with our games consoles. We want them to just work uh, out of the box. So some of the design features of this could very much uh, be used uh, by ourselves to make the device simple to use. So OK, how does it work for adults and children? How, how does it? and cope with, the, say, the differences in people's eye se uh, separation into pupillary distance? Well, the answer is we're back to that virtual window again. So in fact, here, I'm just moving a 3D camera around. And notice how little the image is actually changing. And this means that the position of your eyes is actually uh, not, not really critical at all. You can have your eyes in any position, or indeed any uh, interpupillary distance, and you'll still see the same image. We can rotate it vertically. OK, the image is rotating, but we're not getting any vertical parallax. We move it in and out. The image doesn't scale in size. So that's very handy from a software point of view. We can just use a fixed field of view. 
Now, some people talk about the separation of the lenses in the stereoscope as uh, an interocular adjustment. And in fact, it, it isn't. Um, it's for uh, adjusting for different stereo cards. Let's see what would happen if we did adjust the lenses to match our eyes. So this is the classic stereoscope arrangement, and the lenses are matching the projection centers of the image. If we, oops, there we go, move the lenses inwards, suddenly our stereoscope design has gone wrong. And in fact, we'd now have to diverge our eyes to see the image. We'd have to move the projection centers inwards to match if we were trying to do that. And it's amazing how many uh, books talk about uh, moving the lenses as an interocular uh, adjustment. Even Sir David Brewster, in his original book, talks about moving the lenses from side to side to adjust for people's eyes. And you don't have to. It's, it's actually for adjusting for the different stereo cards. So what have we learned from all this? Well, certainly, the internal alignment is very, very critical. And actually, it's better to not provide it as a user adjustment, because people probably don't know what they're doing. But the good news is, if you get it lined up correctly, the uh, external alignment is very tolerant. If you think of the view master, it just works. And that's ideal for what we're after. OK, well, the stereoscopes so far have had quite a narrow uh, field of view. But really, we would like, if it goes on to the next slide, um, we'd like to have a much wider field of view to immerse ourselves in the scene. Now, certainly, as stereoscope design advanced, they managed to reduce the focal lengths of the lenses to give you a wider field of view. But typically, they more used it for um, creating smaller stereoscopes, more compact stereoscopes. So you might ask the question, well, why didn't they want to produce incredible, immersive, ultra-wide field of view images? Well, I think one of the reasons is, in fact, very uh, well explained in this paper, where when you increase the field of view, you start getting uh, increasing amounts of distortion in the image. Uh, in this case, pincushion distortion, and also chromatic aberrations and, and so on. Now, in this paper, he does suggest an optical arrangement that corrects for that distortion. But even then, you can only get the field of view out to about uh, 80 degrees uh, or so on. Um, it was probably Harvey Ratliff Jr. who first suggested, well, look, why do we really need to do the correction in the optics? What if we? pre-distort the images, apply a barrel distortion, and then when it goes through all the optics, um, it'll just look correct. The two distortions will cancel each other out. And this was uh, implemented particularly well by uh, Eric Howlett with his leap optics system. So he had uh, the, the idea of having a camera that created a uh, fisheye distorted image that then went on to medium format film. And then you viewed the image in his viewer that had the exact opposite distortion, so that you saw fantastic linear images with a field of view extending out to 100 degrees or so. And the good news is that we now, and only just really now, we can provide that um, distortion in software, in shaders. So we can create now the fisheye distortion, and then the optics themselves will expand the image back out again to create the linear image that we're after. And it also has an advantage that if you look at the pixels, the smallest in the center, which hopefully is where you're going to be looking, and largest at the edges, which hopefully are going to be towards our peripheral vision. So this is quite an efficient use of the pixels on our display. Now, when you get to very wide fields of view, all sorts of other things start to take effect, like, for instance, the effect of eye rotation. 
So imagine you're looking straight at the center of the display. The edges of the display are going to be seen just in your peripheral vision. If you try and look towards those edges, you, you rotate your eye, and your pupil has actually changed position. And that has the effect of altering the field of view. So it's very difficult to uh, talk about fields of view when you're talking about very wide field of view displays. What do you mean? Do you mean the direct gaze field of view or the field of view that you get in your peripheral vision? And this sort of interaction between uh, the uh, lenses and your eyes is very much the territory of optometry, traditional optometry. And actually, we can learn a great deal uh, from the expertise in that area. For example, people's glasses tend to be tilted forward slightly, and that's referred to as pantoscopic tilt. Now, we made the decision on our device to um, not comp uh, compensate internally for uh, people's different prescriptions, but instead allow you to wear your own glasses with the device, just to keep things simple again. So we tilt the optical block of our device to match the pantoscopic tilt of the glasses, which gives glasses wearers a much wider field of view. But it's also good for non-glasses wearers as well, um, because human vision is biased downwards slightly anyway. OK, so we've got a wide field of view. So now, if we add head tracking, we can effectively give ourselves an unlimited field of view. Now, head tracking with computer-generated images was uh, first carried out by Ivan Sutherland back in the late uh, 1960s with a mechanical arrangement and simple wireframe graphics to keep the frame rate high. There's various different ways you can do uh, tracking. On our device, we have on board uh, accelerometers and gyros. Accelerometers measure, of course, acceleration and gravity as well. And the gyros measure uh, orientation changes. And also, we've got a number of LEDs that are, can be tracked positionally by the PlayStation 4's own stereoscopic camera. So how does this all work? Well, imagine that this is the head movement that you're trying to detect. The accelerometers and gyros data come in at about 1,000 times a second and give you this sort of effect, where you're getting all the high-frequency movement being captured really well. But if you look very closely, you can see it's not actually pointing in the right direction, and it's going to drift over time as well. The feed from the camera that's tracking the LEDs gives you a very different kind of data. It's coming in at a much lower rate, 60 times a second, but it's accurate and it doesn't drift. So what we do is we take those two types of data and fuse them together to give the best of both worlds. So now we have high frequency tracking that also is accurate and doesn't drift over time. So we're now ready to create some images for our virtual reality experience. And I thought it'd be worth just showing you how far uh, interactive computer graphics, image generation, has come with the, the latest generation of games consoles. So what you're about to see, sorry, it's not in 3D, but it's uh, Evolution Studios Drive Club for the PlayStation 4. And remember, what you're about to see is all rendered entirely in real time. So there we go. There is actually a little bit of audio in the background if you wanted to fade a level, but you just have to make your own engine noises. Oh, there we go. Um, you can see how realistic these images appear. And in a moment, we'll go inside the car and have a look at how the rainwater uh, behaves on the windscreen. 
it's actually modelled so it interacts with the airflow and the lateral forces on the vehicle, just as it would in real life. So we can certainly generate some very compelling images now. There's just one problem, and that is that typically image generation is carried out across multiple processors, and often it's done in a sort of pipeline arrangement where the processing is handed from one processor to the other over a few frames. And you can imagine that's not a, a great thing because what happens is that the tracking information that you read at the start of the image generation process is going to be very out of date by the time you look at it on the display. Now, having said that, developers are coming up with all sorts of clever ways to reduce this problem. But nevertheless, uh, let's have a look at what happens when you have latency. So imagine that this is perfect tracking. This is what we're trying to achieve. If we add latency, we get this kind of effect. So there's a bit of a delay. And in particular, it's going to be horrible when you stop turning your head and the whole world carries on moving. That's going to be really disorientating for people. And we have to do something about that. So what's the answer? Well, one thing we can do is make a prediction of where the viewer's head is likely to be at the time when the frame is being displayed. And with 1,000 hertz uh, sensors, we can actually do quite a good job of that. So this is sort of what we get with prediction. Now, often, using prediction is sufficient to solve the latency problem. But here, I've slightly exaggerated the effect. And you can see it's, it's not perfect. It's been caught out at the beginning and end of the motion because it, you, obviously you can't predict those things correctly. So there is a, another technique that is available to developers, and that's referred to as last-minute reprojection. So the idea with that is that just before you display the image, you reread the tracking information, and that gives you the error that you're going to have. And then you just shift the image slightly to compensate for that error. So this is what you get with reprojection. And in fact, you can see that now we're getting very, very close to perfect tracking. In fact, the only thing that gives it away is if you look at the edges of the image, you can see that they're sort of slide, side slipping um, to a certain degree. And we can correct for that by just rendering to a wider field of view. So actually, it's now possible to create the illusion of zero latency, which uh, is really essential for virtual reality to work. So there's a lot of uh, things that we've been, we're now able to do that, say, in the 90s, we, we couldn't achieve. And it's all down to increased processing power. We can do that optics pre-distortion to the leap style uh, wide field of view optics. We can uh, do good quality head tracking and sensor, fu uh, sensor fusion and so on. Of course, we can generate compelling looking images and also correct for any latency problems as well. So right, finally, we're ready to show some stereoscopic 3D on our device. Now, traditional uh, 3D displays are referred to as only being able to show a narrow range of parallax uh, with a guaranteed level of comfort. And so we use stereography to manage the 3D settings, the interaxial uh, and horizontal image translation. Um, last time, I demonstrated some software that allows you to do that uh, with with games. So you can see as I'm moving the camera around, it's constantly adjusting the 3D settings to maintain comfort. But here's the question. Why do we need to do that? Why can't we just show the full range of parallax? And in truth, you probably need a whole conference to answer uh, that question. And I suspect 
um, throughout this conference, we'll be looking at that. Um, but I suspect a lot of it is down to you, typically people not viewing the uh, content from um, the exact perfect position in front of the display. If you're a little bit off axis, you're going to get uh, a bit of keystone distortion, vertical parallax, that kind of thing. Certainly it's true that if you compensate for the viewing position, you can show a much wider range of parallax comfortably. And anyone who's familiar with using a virtual reality cave will know that, that you can show a lot more parallax in a device such as that without too many problems. Now, the head-mounted display had that virtual window idea, so we can maintain the uh, consistent viewing uh, scenario. And um, whether it's for reasons of that or other reasons, one thing is certainly true. You can show a much wider range of parallax um, in a head-mounted display than you can on a con uh, con um, traditional um, 3D display. So we have the uh, ability to show orthostereoscopic depth, real-world one-to-one depth. We can have perfect matched fields of view, have the cameras where our eyes would be, and that should greatly enhance the sense of immersion. Having said that, that doesn't mean to say that uh, we can dispense with the concept of having comfortable 3D. So have a look at this image. So this uh, image is within a parallax range that would be legal to be broadcast on Sky's 3D channel. And yet, as you can see, it's horrible. And now, I'm not an expert at this kind of thing, but I suspect the problem is that um, we can only fuse a narrow range of depth at any one time. Anything beyond that, and you see a double image, and you have to reconverge your eyes to view it. And what's happening with that text in the middle is we're probably having to reconverge our eyes for every letter, which is really horrible. In fact, I'll get rid of it. So we can move the parallax to a narrow range, and suddenly it is comfortable to view. Now, this isn't just a problem with virtual reality. It's a problem with the real world. And it's why cars are now being fitted with head-up displays so that the um, driving information is being shown at the same depth as the road where the driver is looking. And we need to do this in virtual reality as much as possible when we're showing user interfaces. We need to keep the depth close to where we expect the viewer is going to be looking. So we've got orthostereoscopic viewing conditions. And actually, this is something that the Victorians were able to do as well. Typically, the 3D cameras had lenses roughly six and a half centimeters apart, similar to our eyes. And the focal length of the lenses in the cameras matched the focal lengths of the stereoscopes. And I'll just demonstrate that um, with this example here. So the image on the left I took a few years ago uh, using just a, a compact camera with the image at a particular uh, focal length. The image on the right I took with the same compact camera, the same focal length, but looking through a stereoscope. And this time, it's looking at a glass slide taken by Charles Breeze back uh, in 1860, exactly the same view. And here's the thing. I've cropped the image for the presentation, but I've not scaled it. The two images are exactly the same size. So in other words, the image on the display was exactly the same size. And what that means is that when we're viewing that image in the stereoscope, we are seeing Fountain's Abbey at the exact same size that it would have been um, if we'd been there in 1860 looking at it for real. So it's powerful stuff. And of course, we can do more than that in virtual reality because we've got head tracking. So for example, we could record the orientation of the camera and show the image in the same orientation that it was taken. So if you were looking at a tall building, then why not uh, show the photograph in that orientation? So you have to look up to see it. But of course, 
We can do so much more with virtual reality. We can uh, project images onto, for example, a sphere, view it from the center of the sphere, and we can have a complete 360 one-to-one -one recreation of the world. And the images can be stored in this format, which is referred to uh, as equirectangular projection. And it's a bit like how a map of the world is done. Now, capturing images for virtual reality, well, we could use a conventional camera. The only problem is, as we get an increased wide field of view, we get uh, increased distortion. Now, that's not a problem for viewing in virtual reality but because we just see it completely one-to-one -one if, the, if the fields of view are matched. But what it does mean is that there's going to be less detail recorded in the center of the image than at the edges. So it's not really a very efficient way of storing the data. A better approach, if the clicker will work, oh, there we go, is to use a fisheye lens. And if we look at the same regions again, you can see they're much more consistent, uh, which is what we're after. Now, when we want really wide fields of view, then we're into the realms of needing multiple cameras and stitching the images together. And the only problem with doing that is that any difference in the position of the lenses is going to create parallax which is going to make the images difficult to stitch together. So really, you want the lenses to be as close together as possible. And the Fraunhofer Institute have come up with a quite innovative solution where they use mirrors so that the reflections of the cameras all appear at exactly the same point. So that means that images captured with that camera don't have any parallax stitching problems. Now, so far, I've conveniently talked about monoscopic image capture, but of course, this is a stereoscopic conference, so really we want to capture uh, 3D images for virtual reality. Now, we have a massive problem here, because when we create a stereo pair, the parallax is only recorded in one direction. Having said that, traditional IMAX uh, 3D films actually work very well in virtual reality, particularly the shots created with a 30 millimeter fisheye lens, which gives you a view out to 140 degrees. And if you undistort it and make it um, you know, perfect and linear, it la looks absolutely stunning. If we want wider fields of view, we're back to using multiple cameras again. And you can extract the images with this technique that's probably too complicated to mention uh, briefly, but you can create the two left eye and right eye images uh, for the 3D. There's just one problem. You, okay, you could capture real world parallax by having your cameras six and a half centimeters apart, but that same parallax is going to cause stitching problems when we join the images together. And here's the thing. No one has actually solved this problem yet, as far as I can tell. There may be a way of doing it um, in software, using depth maps and horizontally scaling images and that sort of thing, but no one has successfully uh, achieved this yet. For static images, it's a simpler uh, situation. You can capture stereo pairs, and the more stereo pairs you capture, the less error there is between each image, and you can stitch them all together. Or you can use sort of line scan techniques uh, with horizontal sweeps, as was done with um, Sony's own uh, Cybershot camera when it created horizontal sweep panoramas. So, OK, let's say we can capture full 360-degree stereo images. How do we record the parallax? Well, certainly the convention would be to just record it in this sort of uh, orientation, so um, horizontal in the equirectangular projection. This certainly gives you a full 360 degree uh, coverage, but let's see what happens to the images when we view them in virtual reality. So 
There's an image. It's OK, but if you look closely, you can see there's something going a bit wrong at the edges. Um, and if we look at what's happened to those lovely horizontal arrows, we can see the problem. The parallax is in all sorts of directions now, and it's going to be quite uncomfortable to view. In fact, the more vertically we look up and down, the worse the problem gets. The floor there is horrible. Um, and again, if we look at the arrows, you can see why. In fact, we're getting image rotation rather than uh, uh, horizontal translation. So could we come up with a way of improving that situation? If you think about it, in virtual reality, you can, you're representing depth with the photograph in two ways. You've got the uh, distance of the screen, the virtual screen, that is, not the head-mounted display, and then the parallax on that screen, which can be, of course, negative and, and positive. And it's the parallax that's the bad thing. That's the thing we want to try and get rid of. So could we apply horizontal image translation to reduce the parallax from the source image and move the screen to compensate? So I'll, I'll show you what I, what I mean. So imagine this situation were the zero parallax point is, well, a very long way away. So this would need to be shown on a really large sphere. And everything else is in negative parallax coming towards you. Well, if we want to look at the floor, what we could do is apply horizontal image translation to reduce the parallax. And then view the image on a screen that's much closer towards us, let's say about the distance of the floor, maybe one and a half meters. So this was our original image of the floor. Um, yeah, it's horrible. And it's horrible because the floor is being represented with, by an enormous quantity of negative parallax um, on the screen that's a very long way away. So there we go. We've just applied the uh, correction. So now the parallax is removed from the source image, and it's shown on a much smaller screen. The depth in the areas that were OK K will, will still look um, perfectly fine, but we've now got a much more viewable image. So it's a funny situation, really. Traditionally, with stereography, we looked at having a fixed screen, and then we apply dynamic calculations to uh, keep the parallax viewable. And we've sort of got the reverse process now, where we're talking about using fixed camera settings but then maybe dynamically altering the screen to match the viewing conditions. So that's something that uh, is still very much an area of research. There are actually some more fundamental problems with uh, capturing images for virtual reality. This one, if you've got an omnidirectional camera, actually, where do you hide the camera crew? In fact, how do you even cope with the tripod? And actually, there's a more fundamental problem with, um, or challenge, shall we say, with virtual reality content in general, not just photographs. Um, that is, how do you know the viewer is looking in the right direction? How does the viewer know that there's not something much more interesting going on directly behind them uh, all the time? So that is uh, certainly a challenge. But having said that, um, London Studios uh, last year created a demo uh, for Project Morpheus that actually exploits this uh, problem and creates a very unnerving effect. It's a shark cage diving experience. Now, what I've done today is I've attempted to transfer it onto the uh, screen for you, but the original was all sort of orthostereoscopic and so on. So um, it doesn't work so well. You have to try and use your imagination. Try and imagine that you're looking at this with a 90-degree field of view, with full head tracking, binaural 3D audio. And also, bear in mind that what you're about to see is not a movie. All the images that you see are being calculated and, and rendered in real time.
JJ's got something on the scope. It's one big ping and it's headed your way. Stay sharp. That's only going to annoy it. So there we are, not a very well designed shark cage, it has to be said. Um, but remember, as I say, all those images are being generated in real time on the PlayStation 4. So we're seeing that there's actually a great deal uh, that we still have to learn with virtual reality. And actually, this is a bit of an admission, but we as an industry um, only know a fraction of the knowledge that's already been amassed uh, with virtual reality research over the years. So there's an enormous opportunity for people to rediscover lost experiments, maybe recreate them with the new technology, and also to do exciting uh, new research of your own. So just to conclude, we've come an enormously long way in the, in the last 160 years. And yet I, I really think that, in a way, we're only just at the beginning. And it's going to be fascinating to see how this uh, technology progresses in the future. So, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, Dwayne. I know this audience will appreciate both the, the technical uh, side of what Ian's been talking about and the huge amount of effort he's put into this presentation today. It was an excellent presentation for us. Um, and if anyone's got some questions, he's um, able to answer many things, but not necessarily everything. I'll do my best. So I have a question and a comment. First, a comment. If you could Adam, say your name and... Uh, Susanne klein Hewlett packard So first, Adam Mother, I'm giving up now. If this headset comes out, I will not be able to get my sons off the PlayStation ever again. <laughs> so don't do it. <laughs> Sorry so about that. <laughs> um, so the question is about motion sickness. Because now the virtual reality is, de is detached from any gravitational information. So with the static stereoscopic view, it's not so much a problem because it's still. But what will you do about it? Well, you notice that quite a lot of those demonstrations involved static viewpoints, and something like the shark diving experience uh, you know, was like that. And also, um, with the, uh, the virtual reality live action capture, um, we've really had the most success with um, static cameras or very limited movement. And I think it's, it's cautious steps, really. Um, people are finding that, for example, if you move forwards, it seems to be okay. Most people can cope with that. Some people still can't, having said that. Um, but lateral movement is really nasty and really unnerving. So I think that actually there's a, there's a general comment that we, we need to try and deliver what people expect. So what I mean is, if you put the thing on and something unpredictable happens, 
you just immediately want to take it off. It's suddenly, you know, it's a very unnerving experience. So, you know, if you get to a situation where you can move yourself around with a joystick or something like that, and it's behaving exactly as you would expect it to behave, you, you can cope with it. And that, that, you, you get used to it over time. Where we find that people who've um, done a lot of virtual reality um, suddenly now can actually move around the world uh, relatively easy because they know what to expect. It's a, it's a bit like driving a car and hitting a spot of black ice or something, and it's that feeling of, I'm, out, I'm suddenly out of control. And as long as you maintain control, um, we seem to have a lot more uh, success. Well, what's the field of view and the resolution of the display? Well, um, at the moment, it's only a prototype, so it can change. We quote it's about 90 degrees field of view on our current um, uh, uh, design. And each eye is seeing um, 960 by 1080 um, resolution. Um, and we rely heavily, actually, on the, um, the leap distortion to reduce the size of the pixels in the center to maintain you know, a level of visual acuity. That it's, it's actually surprisingly acceptable. I mean, it sounds not great, really. And it will get better, of course. Um, it's bound to. That's why I say we're only at the beginning. But it, it, it's, it's surprisingly OK. John Merritt. I want to congratulate you on showing this audience one of the most beautiful uses of stereo in a presentation that Thank I've you. ever seen. Thank you. Thank you very much for your excellent presentation. And I have Thank one you. question. Uh, in your slide, you mentioned that the head-mounted display possesses a much wider uh, a much greater comfort zone compared with the conventional stereoscopic display. Can you explain in more details? Could you say your name and? Oh, I'm Liu Yue from Beijing Institute of Technology. Thank you. That's a, that's a very good question. Um, and I wish I was an expert on this. And I would be able to then spend the next half hour explaining that. Um, I mean, I, I say, you know, one, one reason I suspect is to do with being close to orthostereoscopic depth, but having said that, I'm not sure that is all the, all the reason. Uh, maybe it's something to do with not seeing the edges of the screen as well. You know, you've got that, uh, the, the window, the stereo window, that's very much a point of reference on a conventional screen. We have to be very careful with. Um, and there is no point of reference, so your eye doesn't really have anything to lock onto, so it can sort of lock onto to any distance. And you know it may be something to do with that as well. We, you know, this is a classic example where um, there will be a paper out there that explains all this perfectly, and um, there we are. We, you know, we we should know, but but we don't. Any more questions? So Ian's going to be here uh, through till Wednesday for the discussion forum. So. Um, you can grab him at any time yes. while he's still around and ask him uh, more detailed questions. Um, otherwise, we're back here uh, this morning at 10.50 uh, for the session on 3D camera designs. Um, uh, I guess one more uh, round for, for Ian's excellent presentation. Thank you.